So, Harold, where specifically does the Constitution limit the powers of the federal government and, and state that the states retain most of the powers? The limitations on federal power are specified in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. It is a fairly long section, but it is extremely specific. Essentially, it says that the federal government shall have the power to make war, raise armies and navies, conduct foreign affairs, regulate interstate commerce, and do everything necessary and proper to carry out those specified powers. And that necessary and proper clause has been widely abused by the courts as well. In addition, the ratifiers of the Constitution, the state legislatures or conventions, were very leery of the Constitution as it was originally written because they saw many opportunities for the federal government to abuse its power. Consequently, they insisted that a Bill of Rights specifically spell out what the basic rights were for all Americans. Two of those amendments, the last two in the Bill of Rights, are germane to what we are discussing today. In the Ninth Amendment, it says that the listing of rights in the Constitution does not mean that there aren't other rights that were not listed. So, in essence, saying this is not the exclusive list of rights. Correct. These are specific ones that we, we really want to emphasize that the federal government should not transgress. Right. And then we have the Tenth Amendment, which reads... The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, the original draft of the Tenth Amendment said the powers not expressly delegated to the federal government. However, that language was revised before it was submitted to the states by the first Congress. Now, because that word was removed, some legal scholars have created a doctrine called implied powers, which were not specifically listed. I'll have some more to say about that a little bit later. And a a Alexander Hamilton would have been a proponent of the implied powers <coughs> of the Constitution, would have been one of the founders who would have said, you know, there are some implied powers, they're not specifically laid out, mm -hmm. and that's really sort of that implied powers idea has really paved the way for some of the abuses that you've talked about with the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. In fact, the ink was barely dry on the Tenth Amendment before the attacks began. Chief Justice John Marshall was an advocate of greater federal power. In 1819, financial speculation led to a severe recession in fact, under conditions very similar to what we are experiencing today. In McCullough versus Maryland, the state of Maryland wanted to tax the Bank of the United States to provide funds for low interest loans to help rebuild its economy. The court struck down Maryland's law saying the power to tax is the power to destroy. Now keep in mind that the Bank of the United States, like today's Federal Reserve System, was a private institution. It was not an agency of the federal government. So the decision should not have been made in favor of the Bank of the United States on, the, on that basis. Because it wasn't a, it wasn't a state bank, it, it was it, a private it was, bank. It, it was not a... It was not a federal agency. It was a monopoly that Congress granted to right. a certain corporation. Now, John Marshall was actually, he's sort of pops up a number of times in, throughout the Supreme Court history as one of, the, one of the justices that was involved in some of these other transgressions. Am I correct in that? Yes. Where else was John Marshall involved or was the Supreme Court involved in sort of um, taking away some of the sovereignty of the states. John Marshall 
had a major decision in Marbury versus Madison, which established the principle of judicial review. In later times, we can talk about Texas versus White. This was following the war between the states. Now, Lincoln had used the war between the states to expand federal power. And I won't go into a discussion of that war to any extent, but let's just suffice it to say that slavery was probably not the real reason that the war was fought. It had more to do with unfair economic policies being applied against the South, which tended to concentrate financial power in New York, where it remains today. The Supreme Court, however, tried to legalize the outcome of that war in a decision called Texas versus White in which they declared that the United States was an indivisible union of indestructible states. And since then, the legal scholars have attempted to expand the Interstate Commerce Clause to include all commerce, as we mentioned a minute ago, create that doctrine of implied powers, and theorize that we have a living constitution, meaning that the constitution actually would consist of the constitution plus all the judicial decisions interpreting that constitution. Well, obviously, when you go down that slippery slope, you are creating a license to let the federal government do whatever it wants. Right. And I think uh, Kevin Gutzman says when you espouse this idea of a living constitution, you're really espousing an idea of a dead constitution because it can't defend you from the encroachments of the federal government that it was designed to protect the states from. And so I think that's really, it, you see how, and, and even the founders talked about how, uh, Thomas Jefferson specifically talked about how the Supreme Court would possibly be that branch of government that could undermine the liberties of the people um, through, through this idea of legislating through the bench, which essentially the judicial review was the beginning of that. I want to thank you again for this time that we could talk about. This is such an expansive topic. There's so many different aspects to it. Um, we're, we're going to come back and talk in another segment about how, as the states, now that we've seen this power shifted from the state governments to the federal government, how we can go back and we can sort of take that power back, retain those powers, what we can do on a state level.